It has always been part of human tendency to create, to discover and alter the world around us. To explore the possibilities beyond our present realities. The last couple of decades has seen this tendency manifest itself by leaps and bounds in technology. And at the heart of this has been Silicon Valley. From the first microprocessor through to the inception of the internet and now the latest technology in automation, it has all been developed here. But there is only so far the ambitions of man to change and to disrupt can go before it inflicts suffering in the name of the greater good. What was once heralded as making the world a better place is now being seen as either stagnating, willful or trying to take away jobs. I am Manu Sri Kumar and this is Pranav Chimulkar. We've both been making films about startups in Bangalore for some time now and have been enamored by the tech world for as long as we can remember. And to be honest, the change in the perception of Silicon Valley, the land out of which people have always innovated and pushed boundaries without having to ask permission to do so, has left us perplexed. We had to find out. So we traveled all the way from one startup land to another to seek answers to one question. Is this really the end of the dream that was Silicon Valley? Black ones are are Australorps. Oh, that one. Yeah. And okay. then there's some. This guy here that looks like a hawk is a bird called an Easter egg. Or, these are uh, Rhode Island Reds. Those are Plymouth Rocks. That's a gold lace. Oh, I got them on the internet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> MyPetChicken.com. <laughs> says that you go out and you go to school and you get a job and you go to work and you, just, you, you work there for 40 years and then you get a gold watch and you go home and you retire. You know, and, and counterculture said, no, let's do things differently. And, uh, and there's a, a million ways to do things differently. One of the really interesting things was the emerging of digital technology. Coast. And that's exactly what many of the minds of Silicon Valley strive to do every single day. But where did this constant need to cross the limit come from? And to go even further back, why is it that Silicon Valley is here in California and not anywhere else in America or the world? It goes back to the gold rush. The gold rush in 1848 and 49 and 50 caused the greatest relocation of people in the world since the Crusades. They were almost all young men, men of consequence, men with some money, and they came here with a dream of striking it rich. And it really led to the whole rush mentality. And this rush mentality did the new immigrants very well. It led to the railroad boom, followed by exponential growth in real estate, shipbuilding, airplanes, and of course, Hollywood. And then in about 1900, the electronic age was born, just like that, it was amazing. It happened when Lee DeForest invented the vacuum tube in Palo Alto. The vacuum tube was a, a tube used to modulate sound and used in, in audio equipment. And then it was discovered it could be a switch. And then that led to the computer. So it all started with Gold Rush. At the time, everybody knew what computers were. There were these, these multi-million dollar machines that were owned by corporations to do back office work. And the whole infrastructure of all the companies that provided that kind of technology, we're all bowing to that, that archetype of how things were. And Intel invented this computer on a chip. You know, the 8080 was the first successful microprocessor. It was these microprocessors made of silicon that gave the valley its name. It caused a revolution that for the first time enabled a computer to sit on a desk. The first ever successful PC was the Altair 8800 and from there, there was no stopping the tech boom.
I started Bucks 27 years ago. We just sort of kicked the doors open and we were just a regular restaurant, a people feeder. Uh, since then we've seen hundreds of firms have their inceptions here. Netscape had a lot of their early meetings here. Uh, at this table right next to us, PayPal got funded. Right across the room is where Tesla got their first money. Unlike a lot of other parts of the world, we have, uh, we have the ability, the desire, and the practice of recycling our talent instead of throwing it away. That is the greatest conservation of intellectual resource you can imagine. Because I know in Europe, classically, it's been if you start a business and you take your friends and family and bank money and it doesn't work out, it's sayonara. They don't want to see you again because you failed. Because the reason for that is uh, they got hundreds, even thousands of years of tradition and history. And here, we don't have those hundreds of years of tradition. We have 150 years of tradition, and that's just stuff we invented. It's, it's no wonder that the biggest gay population in the world is in San Francisco, that the creative arts are, are so dynamic here, that a lot of the different things that emerge from America are from here because we're very experimental. But the recycling of talent is the key thing. Although uh, Travis from Uber, it's gonna take a while for him to recycle. <laughs> How are you? Good to see you. I'm fine, thank you. The most important reason for success of startups in uh, Northern California, I think is the culture of how people are okay to try new things, bold things. And at the same time, if you fail, it's okay. I have uh, funded an entrepreneur three times. I hope the third time will be the charm. So a bone breaks and it grows back and it's stronger. We say move fast and break things. And I love that idea of failing forward because we are going to fail. Any part of the algorithm of success inc must include failure. And how we bounce back from that failure determines whether we succeed or fail. So resilience is embedded in everything. Even though Facebook changed their motto from move fast and break things to move fast with stable infra back in 2014, it is exactly this mindset of breaking things that got Facebook to the top. Several social media platforms had had their time in the sun before Facebook. In India in particular, there was one website that ruled the roost for several years. It was called Orkut. Orkut.com was built in a different era with a different generation in mind and so much happened in uh, the infrastructure, the technology, the way uh, people access online. If you look at Orkut.com, it was all web-based, people use like desktops uh, to access it and it, it was time to create a new experience for like the new generation. Google's Orkut was forced to shut down operations due to Facebook's fairly aggressive moves to take over its market. Apart from providing features at breakneck speed, even if they were buggy, Facebook's most preemptive strike was to provide their users with an Orkut import tool so they could easily find their Orkut friends on Facebook. This tool was actively advertised even in the US, where Orkut had only 1% unique visitors compared to Facebook. But this didn't mean Orkut was done. Within two years of Awkward.com's shutdown, he is now independent of Google and has started a new social media venture called Hello. Oh, yes! <laughs> but Facebook is not the only one to take aggressive measures to get rid of its competition or buy them out. The big four of technology, which Facebook is a part of along with Apple, Google and Amazon, have also done similarly. What's ironic? is that these companies were once celebrated for being startups taking on their Goliath-sized competitors. And now that they've become Goliaths themselves, no new startup has been able to stand up to them in the last decade. I don't think it takes a lot. I mean, if you look at the stories of a lot of the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, the original entrepreneurs, you'll find similar stories. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have huge opportunities, but they had just enough opportunities. Nowadays, the people who 
who start companies today, successful companies, tend to be people who already have lots of money and already have lots of connections. There are certainly exceptions to that rule, but in general, the people who who have you know hundred million dollar deals do not start out as middle class guys. So either you already reap the benefits of being an early entrepreneur or you've got rich parents with connections. And yet everywhere you go in Silicon Valley, you'll see that it's teeming with new startups. And it makes you think, are these people living in a bubble or have the critics got it all wrong? Now we don't want to come across as anti-progress. There's no denying that a lot of technology coming out of Silicon Valley has changed the world for the better. We're more connected than ever and finding solutions to problems has become easier. But there's also the fact that Silicon Valley is not as it used to be. The last year has been its least innovative and more companies have died out than have been formed. So it emphatically begs the question, is there any scope for new businesses to thrive in Silicon Valley? Will David rise again?